I'm Conrad Soss now, and I live here in beautiful Mountain View. And my uh, bottom line is, I want to revote. So I voted for 1A, but since then, the cost has gone up by a factor of three. Time has been extended dramatically. The projections for passengers is down. The ticket cost is up. So I'm trying to wonder, was this either because of gross incompetence or was it deliberate fraud on the voters? So I want to revote to be able to go up or down. Now what I heard tonight is a rational person would take the California money and build the Bakersfield to Palmdale line. That's the rational person, but not the political person. So let me give you two predictions. One, political pressure from Washington will force the 130 miles built in Central Valley. Washington will call Jerry Brown. Jerry Brown's office will call all of you. They'll squeeze, and it's going to happen. That's my first prediction. The second prediction is someday your grandchildren will visit the California Railroad Museum in Sacramento, and on display, they'll see this platinum spike. And what it'll say is this is the spike from the 130-mile Obama Railroad in Central California. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next witness is, welcome. Pam Farley. Welcome. Um, as far as spending goes, the problem that we have is that California already has so much debt that we can't look forward to 20 years of spending something that's integral maybe to our, to our state. Um, I have a problem with ridership subsidies. That means more taxes to me. I also have a problem with cap and trade revenues, which I'm not quite sure how you're going to get revenues from cap and trade other than it means more taxes on someone. Um, I think we really, I would like to see the legislator focus more on the coming unfunded pension tsunami that's going to hit California in the next 30 years. So I would say no on high-speed rail at this point. We don't have the money. Thank you for your comments. Let me ask if Christopher Parkinson, Butch Cabrera, Jim Bigelow, Bob Saldick, or Brian Reisdorf are here, if they would step up, please, in any order. Christopher Parkinson, Butch Cabrera, Jim Bigelow, Bob Saldick, and Brian Reisdorf. <coughs> Mr. Saldick, go right ahead, sir. Well, good evening. My name is Bob Saldick. I'm delivering a message from my wife, Virginia Saldick. She would love to be here, but she was accidentally knocked down while leaving a Peninsula Cities Consortium meeting in Brisbane on high-speed rail. She broke her hip but I hope she's somehow listening to this program. Virginia's message. How dare them to gut the crown jewel of California, this higher education system, especially the University of California, for such a specious and unneeded project as high-speed rail. They're going to bankrupt the state and put it into overwhelming debt and debt service to garner funds that nowhere near balance the cost of acquiring those funds. The project will eviscerate impact, in, intact neighborhoods as well and put a heavy industrial project in dense residential neighborhoods. She's, she's talking about Palo Alto. In just the six block by eight block neighborhood in the east of the Jackson Old Palo Alto, there were 267 homes either newly built or so substantially remodeled that their year built done is effectively the remodel date. I can testify to the accuracy driving her around all the old houses in Palo Alto. Don't let creeping blight reverse this trend. On the west side of the tracks in the Southgate neighborhood, the environmental impact uh, reaches half the neighborhood. Irresponsible governance in its extreme. Her advice? Feed Jerry Brown's ego some other way that doesn't damage the quality of life. Give these good people the benefit of the whole and don't burden their children as well with the crippling state debt. Preserve the low-cost public education system of the state and the traditional path of upward mobility in the state. Let, th let them be Jerry Brown's legislative legacy. Thank you, Mr. Saltick. 
Next witness is? Jim Bigelow. Welcome, from the River Bigelow. City, San Mateo County Chamber. No stranger to this subject. Uh, the most recent and most focused points of your uh, discussion have been the early opportunity for early investment in the bookends. And that is quite appealing down south as well as on the peninsula. Uh, Caltrain uh, and high-speed rail uh, are 100% compatible. Caltrain worked for three years to get a new national standard for lighter weight electric trains, which helps speed up the high-speed rail implementation. And uh, our chamber board is going to be addressing this further on the early opportunity in the MTC MOU uh, next week at their board meeting. Uh, so I think uh, this is promising, uh, positive news. And I can tell you, as I have probably in the past as a pilot, I've flown a multi-engine airplane behind a heavy jet, and you get wake turbulence. And the FAA had to change the in-trail standard from three nautical miles when you're in the overcast coming in on an approach because of the buffeting of a heavy aircraft like a 747, a 777, and so forth. So that's reduced the capacity of the airports. Then when you take and you have an extended lower ceiling, you have to cancel flights, you have to delay flights all over the U.S. The fly California that's on the side of this train totally makes sense to me as a pilot. So next time you look at the picture and says fly California, there's a reason. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next witness. Welcome. My name's Brian Reisdorf, and I'm actually a resident of Santa Clara, not in your district, but I came here because I'm concerned on this issue. Um, I support high-speed rail, and high-speed rail is pr proven to be the most environmentally sensitive form of long-distance transportation. I support the, the rail authority's plan to build in the Central Valley and the blended approach on the Pen Peninsula and in Southern California. And high-speed rail is more than just an efficient and sustainable form of transportation. It supports better development patterns as we d design and build our cities. Um, it will actually should improve the livability on the peninsula. And I suspect a lot of the opponents of this project face their opposition just on the changes needed to the Caltrain right-of-way. They ignore the fact that many of those changes are needed regardless, even if there's no high-speed rail. If you want a system that is comparable to BART in efficiency and serving the people, we need grade separation on Caltrain. We need electrification. And the media hasn't been helping to, to spread informed information. Papers like the Palapa Daily are pretty biased in the reporting. They're more like editorial pieces. And um, Palo Alto is actually my hometown. It's where I grew up. But I'm actually ashamed of a lot of the self-serving opposition to the high-speed rail project. You know, global warming is a serious problem. But in Palo Alto, they're more concerned about losing one lane of traffic on Alma. You know, it's, you know, it's what Al Gore says. They're not willing to face any inconvenient truths. And it's a city, in a way, not just Palo Alto, but up the peninsula. Many of the cities, they just rep epitomize the kind of the hypocrisy. And I think the hypocrisy, if you, you Q's authority of, say, building in the Central Valley as their first initial segment. Then cities like Palo Alto talk about building a tunnel, a four-track tunnel to, you know, it's not as simple as building a tunnel for BART. It's a major impact and major expense. And so there are reasons why building in the Central Valley to get the most mileage for the limited funds they got from government. So that's it. Thank, Thank you for your comments. I don't think Christopher Parkinson and Butch Cabrera are still with us. All right, if not, we'll go to a new group of speakers. We have Carrie Holtzmer, followed by Aaron, I believe it's Fukuda, followed by Ross Browning, followed by Terry Brozell. Any of you here? Yes, making your way to the microphone. And I know we're going to lose a couple of my colleagues who have a two-hour drive back to Sacramento coming up. Uh, in about 10 minutes, and I thank them for sticking with us as long as they can. I have what I would call a lot of cards. The difficulty is that a number of folks have given it up for the evening. 
So we're going to keep taking them randomly as I have this evening, and, and I'm going to stay until the last person has testified. Absolutely. Good evening, Senators. Thank you very much for hosting this event. My name is Aaron Hercuda, and I've traveled here from the Central Valley representing citizens for California high-speed rail accountability. My take-home point, the Valley doesn't want this project. We ask our legislators, please stop the mismanagement of this project and vanquish that black cloud you were talking about over all of our residents. We call that black cloud, cloud high-speed rail. I was going to give you a talk today, but I noticed there were some talking points up here, and it harkens back to the December 5th hearing at which I was at. It seems like the authority wants to pressure the legislators into making the decision quickly and inefficiently, like they produce their reports. At that meeting, they indicated that we have to get this project going by September 2012, and they said it was in the contract. Now, all of a sudden, that date has magically disappeared, and the date that actually shows up is, oh, we just need to get it done by 2017. I think they're hoping that nobody goes back in time and says, how many times did they say fall of 2012 construction must begin? We'll go back and count. We'll get back to you. They also said today that um, they think that the price is going to decrease. I have to say I think the price is going to increase. I say that because I come from the ground up, seeing the plans and the project being built. They don't have a, a it's not cohesive. So what happens when you start doing something that's not cohesive? Your costs start increasing. So even though the governor and the authorities that may say the price is going down, we know at the backside the plans aren't finished and the price is going up. So we're probably going to be in that hundred and some odd billion dollars, which is on page 230 of the business plan, which is hidden and only mentioned once. The 98.5 is not the realistic number. 117.6 is the realistic number. I did also notice today that they had indicated that, well, uh, the our mandates that this begin in the Central Valley. And I had somebody come up here, and I know they're, they're jokingly saying it's the train to nowhere. That's our nowhere. We work hard on it, and it worked hard for all of you people. Um, so it's not just our nowhere. And I took Mr. Hartnett's comments that said that they're going to be giving a, a billion dollars to the southern and northern areas because he feels that it's best if they can direct where that money is. I challenge you. Give that money to our $6 billion to us, and we'll put it to good use. We will get high-speed rail going. Disband the authority. The time is not now. The authority is not the team. Give it to somebody else that can get it done. Thank you, Mr. Perguda. And thank you for your comments. Next witness is? My name is Ross Browning. Welcome, Mr. Browning. From King County. Um, before I go on, I would like to thank Dan and Jim for being here. This is the first time... Uh, that I've ever been at a hearing that anyone from the board has stayed for the public comment. I don't know if it's going to do any good, but thank you for being here. Uh, my theme, I, I'd like to talk to you about two things that, that cause me a, a deal of nervousness, some anxiety, and the reason is because I can't find an answer to these things. I have no answer to give to my grandkids, great-grandkids, and they are, it, it takes two different forms. I imagine that I wake up one morning and somehow this system, which I don't believe can be built for Prop 1A, somehow this system is built. I don't know how it happened, but it's there. And, all of that, the, and they realize then we don't have any more money. Well, the system is built, everything is good, except there is no infrastructure. They keep saying we're going to do it like they do in Europe. Europe has the infrastructure first, then they built the, the, the rail system, the long-distance rail system. Uh, that's one of the things I, I have no answers for. The other one is, if we build it in the valley, or bookends, or wherever you want to build it, but somewhere it's going to be in the valley, it's going to start in Fresno, and let's say the money runs out. There is no more money. The Californian public is just fed up. We just aren't going to spend any more. What do we do then? We've got a big hole, and there's no money left. Thank you much. Thank you very much for your comment. Gary Brazell and Terry Haltimer. Thank you, Senators. I'm Jerry Brazell. I live in the peninsula 700 feet from the right of way, and I'm in favor of high speed rail. Uh, the topic is faster, cleaner, and cheaper. It's faster, cleaner, and cheaper. 
when I'm done, I'm going to give you a test on this, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Faster, cleaner, cheaper. Okay, I used the rail system. When I was in the Army over 50 years ago, I took leave to Japan and rode the Japanese bullet there. And I thought, gee, this is great. We'll have something like that in 10 or 15 years in the United States. Well, over 50 years later, we're still talking about it. Uh, I took a trip to China six years before the Olympics and uh, rode the maglev train over there. And I thought, wow, yeah, I've been in Europe and all of that, and I keep looking around. The whole world's ahead of us, really. And it's, to me, it's shameful. Now, I use the rail, and I've taken the trains down to Senator Lowenthal's area there in Los Angeles from San Jose. Now, Senator Correa, how long do you think it would go, take to go by train from San Jose to Los Angeles? I'm hard of hearing. I, no, just go right ahead. It's your ahead, microphone. Sir. How long? That's a, I'll take it as a statement, so continue. Ten okay. Minutes. Well, anybody in the audience know how long it takes? Hours. No, it takes 11 hours. Oh, there you go. Okay. You there you go. 11 hours. That's shameful and disgraceful. We need something faster, which is high-speed rail. How long do you think it takes by high-speed rail to go from San Jose to Los Angeles? Two hours. That's progress. That's real progress. Faster, cleaner, cheaper. Well, I've hit the faster part. I'm right on the time for cleaner and cheaper. But that was the topic, and I could get into that. But thank you I'm very out of time. much. Thank you very much. Is Terry Holtzmer still here? Okay. Then I think uh, we're going to take a, a, just a moment's pause. Let Senator Correa and Senator Lowenthal head back to Sacramento. I want to thank them again for joining us today. And why don't you make your exit, gentlemen, and we'll move on with. Uh, <coughs> you. Mimi Steele, Gary Wesley, and William Black. To be followed by Pat Giorni or Giorni, Giorni and Marion Lee. And if you're a witness, just step right up and announce your name, and we'll take you. Gary Wesley from Mountain View. Uh, what's going to happen with the ridership when a train derails? There are some million people who have been employed since 9-11-2001 in Homeland Security. When bin Laden was caught, if he was, the federal government contends <coughs> that there were plans in that compound to attack American trains. Nobody is going to ride on this system the first time a terrorist derails a train. So as we select forms of transportation or forms of energy to use going into the future, we better be aware of the prospect that terrorists will destroy us. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Next witness. Yes, I'm William Black from San Jose. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, Dan Richard. We, we shared, a, I'm an ex-BART manager, and we shared some time at BART together. So we pre I understand his uh, capabilities and really respect them. Um, in regard to his comment about the San Francisco airport funding, uh, he mentioned that half the money was in pocket and the other half they didn't know where it was coming from. In this situation, we have a much greater deficit or under, not, not under understanding where the rest of the money is coming from than just 50-50. Um, we've talked about three times the original estimate so far. Uh, the San Jose City Hall was built, uh, was, was committed uh, by the San Jose voters. The cost went way up. The 49er Stadium in Santa Clara, the cost has gone way up. It's really kind of a bait and switch situation, unfortunately, that happens every single time. Um, the uh, the uh, the funding here is highly speculative. We have, we've been talking about 2.7, 3.6 billion dollars, but the federal government uh, hasn't committed to the other 90 billion or whatever it is. We've been talking around the edges. The big part is we haven't talked about it all. 
Uh, if we have more labor jobs because of building this rail system, it might mean fewer teaching jobs. So you might think about that one also. Uh, who would ride if you're, who would ride? Would you ride it all the time or frequently? If you're on business trip, it's too slow. You'd rather fly. If, uh, if you are on pleasure, you need to rent a car. You need to rent a car on the other end. Uh, California geography is much different than Europe and Japan. Don't have time to elaborate on that. Other states have rejected the high-speed rail plans. Are we going to be less discerning than these other states that had the same kind of meetings we're having tonight? Um, the operating costs. There is not a rail system in the world that operates in the plus, in the desert. It, uh, VTA, San Jose, 15%. BART runs at 60%. The other 40% for BART comes from the taxpayers ongoing. And Mr. Black, I need to ask you to wrap up, if you would, please. I think we need to have a new vote considering the new costs and the new operating uh, costs going on. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. <laughs> Folks, please. Pat Giorni, Marion Lee, and Mimi Steele. Who's up? Any of the three. Well, that's the one that's fighting Miss Marion Lee over free speech, of course. And, and who do we have the privilege of hearing I'm, from? I'm, pardon me? And who are you, ma'am? I am Pat Giorni Welcome. from Bowling Green. Thank you. Uh, I heard earlier this evening that MTC and Caltrain have matching funds for the bookend improvements. However, I want to point out Caltrain has no sustainable uh, source of dedicated funding. And so if the blended system comes with early investment to this section of the peninsula, does Caltrain in effect become de facto high-speed rail until high-speed rail finally builds itself out however it's going to, um, in which case, because Caltrain right now has no sustainable uh, and dedicated source of funding, the state will be actually um, subsidizing high-speed rail, de facto Caltrain, whatever you want to call it, um, because Caltrain has been putting its budget together for the last many years with duct tape, the three partner agencies, San Mateo County, Santa Clara County, and San Francisco County, no longer have the kind of funds that it needs to operate the rail. Therefore, again, I ask, if we put the money into the blended system to get Caltrain electrified and possibly until high-speed rail is running on those tracks, will we be subsidizing Caltrain through 1A funding? Um, I think that it's time that the legislature either pull the plug on this whole high-speed rail deal or put it back to the vote of the people, as is heard much more eloquently here tonight. I'm sorry I'm rambling on, and I was late. I'm going. Goodbye. Thanks for sticking with us, Ms. Giorni. Quite coherent. Thank you. Marion Lee or Mimi Steele? <coughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm Marion Lee. I'm the director of the Caltree Modernization Program. Um, I'd like to start by saying that um, it is our job to constantly strive to provide the best transit service that we can for our customers. And it is with this intent that I'd like to lay out the following facts. Caltrain has had a vision to electrify its system for several decades, way before high-speed rail was born. The benefit to partnering with high-speed rail is the ability to leverage high-speed rail resources to realize our local vision. Our local vision is to provide more service to our customers in a way that is quieter and greener. An electrified system will also bring more fare revenue with increased ridership and reduced fuel costs, which will help with the financial state of Caltrain. There are many properties in our country and across the world that operate a blended system. We have uh, completed a six-month study to see if this is also applicable to our corridor. Based on expertise study, by LTK Engineering Services, they have found that a blended system in our corridor is viable and that we in high-speed rail will be able to provide a safe and reliable service. 
We are focused today on advocating partnership conditions in the discussed MOU that will set clear parameters that address Peninsula stakeholders' interests. We are looking out for the interest of 17 cities and three counties. The most important condition is written agreement that the project is the blended system, which is primarily a two-track system that exists today and not a four-track system originally contemplated by High-Speed Rail. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mike Cobb, John Messina, Sven Thiessen, Judy Fawcett, and Ray Crozier. Are any of you still with us? I see former Mayor Mike Cobb making his way up. Welcome, Mr. Cobb. Sure, let's let folks quiet down just a little bit, if we could, please. Mr. Cobb, welcome. Thanks Honorable for being Senators, here. Senators, as a former mayor, I'm used to asking questions, so I'll put my testimony in question form. Question, why do you continue to facilitate and support high-speed rail when it clearly fa fails to meet the key requirements of the enabling proposition? It doesn't, it won't be self-sustaining, the travel times are too long, the costs are too high, and you've heard some of the other points tonight. Why do you ignore overall ridership projections that are clearly too high, which point again to the fact that it simply cannot be self-sustaining? Why do you support a system that will be a significant additional drain on state finances at a time when we are closing parks, reducing college enrollments, cutting school and social services budgets? How do you justify this? Why do you, why do you use the vote in favor of Prop 1A to justify a project when it is widely recognized that the proposition was misleading and not honestly presented, and in other words, that the voters were, were, did it under fraud or duped? Why do you acknowledge that there is no longer a majority of public support for this project? And, and agree with other people who have said it here and send it back to the voters. And maybe we can get at some time, as this would get first put away a project that doesn't work, get us a project that does work with the goal of something that is feasible, financially supportable, and routed in such a way that doesn't destroy communities and farms. Why do you underestimate the physical impacts of the so-called blended system? Which, which many people feel, and inclu including some of the original high-speed rail management, that it was only a precursor to the four-track system that we all know is unacceptable. And finally, why in all your public discussions do you not openly address the horrific physical impacts of the proposed system, including the loss of hundreds of homes, the devaluing of hundreds more that are adjacent to those homes, the severe traffic impacts of reduced lanes on major streets like Alma, including during the construction process, and isn't it time that you face these residents that will be so affected and tell them that for high-speed rail to move forward, they will have to take one for the team. Don't you owe them that simple truth? Thank you, Mr. Cobb. John Messina, Sven Thiessen, Judy Fawcett, and Ray Crozier. Oh, honorable senators, I'm glad that you stayed to hear the rest of us. Absolutely. Uh, I was sitting behind you, but I believe it was uh, Senator Smithian that said, this is not about jobs. Don't think that was that me, wasn't go, right, go I, I, right ahead. I didn't see who was speaking, but uh, it is primarily about jobs. Most of the supporters for this boondoggle came from unions and people that hope to cash in on, on the jobs building high-speed rail. This was not supposed, Proposition 1A was not supposed to be a welfare for unions. And, I, and one thing I think we really need is a stipulation of some kind that, all, that everyone has a right to work on this project and that contractors cannot exclude non-union people from their jobs. So there needs to be some kind of uh, thing so that anybody can work at these. This is public money, public jobs. Uh, it's my tax dollars. I should, be, I should not be excluded from these jobs just because I'm not a member of the union. And uh, I think all of the contracts for this should stipulate that they cannot discriminate against people just because they're not a member of a union, exclude them from these jobs. The jobs are what this is all about. Uh, Thank you for your comments. And should I get your name just so I can cross off your card? Thanks, Ms. Messina. Forgive me if I missed that. Sven Thiessen, Judy Fawcett, and Ray Crozier. Good evening, Senators. Thank you very much for staying so long. I would have long dived into my smartphone to look at emails. You guys are troopers for staying here. Thank you my so much. My name is Sven Thiessen. I live a block and a half from Caltrain. I rode Caltrain for two years from Palo Alto up to San Francisco. My favorite part of the trip was the Friday afternoon beers on the way back. I am in strong support of California high-speed rail for multiple reasons. Our supporting goals of AB 32, the economics around it. California uses roughly 15 
billion gallons of gasoline a year, ignoring the jet fuel. That's roughly $60 billion per year. And when I look at my family's budget on how we use gasoline, 10% to 20% is local miles, 10 to 20% is up to San Francisco, another 10 to 20% is to Tahoe. The rest of it is south. And all of that's gasoline that is going out of state that could be used to support a Caltrain and advanced, sensible, sustainable, environmentally sound, jobs-creating, technological leadership benefit system. So the problem that you guys have to solve is there's the devil in the detail. And that's your job. I'm glad it's not mine. But as a, my only little bit is I support the blended system. And like they did in Berkeley, because Palo Alto will have a high-speed rail system, if we want it undergrounded, just like Berkeley did with BART, and they want it aesthetically uh, an improvement over the, the elevated corridor that other BART cities have, they paid for it themselves. So I think if Palo Alto, if we're so righteous, and I live there, if we want it underground, we should pay for it. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. Judy Fawcett and Ray Crozier. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. <clears throat> a year ago, I attended your meeting up in Palo Alto in January of last year. Time flies. It's been two plus years. <laughs> Has it been two? <laughs> it's, welcome back. In any event, <laughs> at that time, I um, asked you guys to consider what I called the rule of three. Today, when I came here, I saw that the earlier estimates of 33 to 43 billion had now grown to 98 to 118 billion of the rule of three. But my rule of three was for the cost for the completed program. So, so if I take the cost today and apply the rule of three, you guys will find out what this is really going to cost. I'm, and I'm serious about that. That was a, that rule was based on a dedicated study. I feel that the people of California have got hooked into what I call a bait and switch. What when we voted on back in 2008 is something different than what's before us now. I hear Dan Richards, I believe, say that all oh, these cost estimates, when we really get the date, start coming down. I don't believe that. I believe the rule of three. So I think two things. One, the Senate should not approve the money which is coming due from up here. And I think that this should be put back to a vote by the people of California. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next witnesses are John Montrum, John Carlson, Robert Schwire, Bill Garrett, Margaret, I believe it's pronounced Capriel, but I may be proven wrong, and Jim Jantz. And if you're any one of those folks, come down to the microphone and introduce yourself, please. Good evening. My name is Bill Garrett. Uh, thank you, Senator Sinichian, Senator Desalnier, uh, board members Hartnett and Richard. My theme tonight is skepticism and optimism. Skepticism because as a homeowner in Sunnyvale, my bedroom is less than 150 feet from the Caltrain tracks. Any change to those tracks is going to have a very big impact on not only my home value, but possibly my home itself and clearly my quality of life. Many people in this situation would be mortal opponents of high-speed rail for exactly this reason. But I am not, because I also have optimism. Having traveled the world and experienced high-speed rail in many other countries, including the closest facsimile we have in the United States, the Acela high-speed train in the Northeast Corridor, I've seen the value that high-speed rail has for moving both business travelers and leisure travelers around. And I look forward to your ability to lead us into having that same kind of crown jewel of transit here in California. So I ask you to keep a few factors in mind in leading us toward a successful system. Uh, number one, acknowledge that it's going to be expensive. 
right? The record you can see in any other country that's done it, for example, Taiwan or Japan or Korea, is that cost overruns are just part of the program, right? It's going to be expensive. People are going to doubt it. Let's buck up and accept that that's the reality. But let's also recognize that some of the goals we might Im impose upon it are pretty high lofty goals, like self-sufficiency. If I get in my car and drive to Los Angeles, is that self-sufficient? How many tolls do I pay to support the road I drive to Los Angeles? The road's not self-sufficient. It's supported by extreme government subsidies. Let's understand that other parts of our transit infrastructure will as well. And in helping guide this toward being a successful part of our infrastructure, let's beware of giving away too much to half measures. You know, too, if we have too many links in the system that are 70 mile an hour links, 90 mile an hour links, then we're not looking at a 220 mile an hour system anymore with two hour end to end times from San Francisco to Los Angeles. We might be looking at four to five hour transit times, which would start to shoot our ridership projections as people start to say, I can get there just as fast in my car. Let's keep our transit system a successful one and not cheap out and lose more money with an unsuccessful one. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments. Next witness, step right up. Good evening. My name is John Carlson from Sunnyvale. Um, Thank you for staying at this late hour. I'd also like to thank our uh, board chairman and board member, as well as our uh, ushers and security staff. I really appreciate you staying this late. Um, now, I'd like to simply state that I like high-speed rail. I've experienced it out in um, France and between London and Paris. It's a great system. In Japan, I've had the Shikansen whiz by me. These things are, are quiet runoff electricity, it gives us the option of running off of not just fossil fuel, but renewable supplies as well. Uh, so I, I really like these systems. I also spent some time running my own corporation, and it, I've developed some high-speed uh, rail equipment. So I, I know the industry, I like the technology, uh, but I'm also a bit concerned with the, uh, the authorities management of the project. Here we are more than three years out and we haven't even got a viable business plan. And ultimately, we don't have a plan that, uh, that really honors the contract with the voters that we had in the, in the original proposal back in 2008. So what, uh, what I would like to propose is simply to simplify the business plan, keep it from a single point connecting the two major metropolitan areas within California, say one point attaching to uh, the local metropolitan systems, perhaps in Emeryville or thereabouts, and then going down to Riverside, touching into East Los Angeles. And that way we could go ahead and make the connection, restore some credibility in the program, and restore the California voters' faith in this particular project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Senator Saulnier, I know you have to go at this point to make your way home, so thank you for being with us tonight. And we'll go back to our next witness. Thank you again, Senator Usani. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Senators and Senator. Uh, Jim Jans, Peninsula resident, Caltrain writer, and board member of the uh, Community Coalition on High Speed Rail. My topic tonight is who says the peninsula wants the blended system? Senator Smitty, and I don't think that even you or Assemblymember Gordon or Representative Eshoo were asking for the blended system. Rather, the residents of the peninsula saw your proposal as simply putting a limitation on what they might do to the peninsula in the worst case scenario if they came up the peninsula. It, just as you said to Mr. Hardinett tonight, essentially no takings, no viaducts, and no phase two. The problem is I don't think the authority sees the blended system as anything more than phase one. Despite what we heard tonight, because, and speaking as an attorney who has from time to time been involved in CEQA issues, I don't think you can avoid the full-blown impact of the full-blown project that's in the program EIR by promising that the project level EIR will be limited. The, the full-blown project will be hitting over our heads forever. I might note that Mr. Richard said in uh, January in a public forum that he was surprised when the Pacheco Pass was chosen over Altamont as the route for the uh, for Fusasar, that it appeared that he didn't want to go back to the start on the program EIR. Well, I think you'll have to do that anyway with the blended system. 
So you might just as well redo the program EIR, look at Altamont, and look at all the other options again. Finally, while we may not want the blended system on the peninsula, we do want transit on the peninsula. You heard the LAO representatives tonight. Most people have no problem getting to LA. They do have trouble getting to work. But as residents of the peninsula, we are not at all sure that Caltrain electrification is the only answer for peninsula transit. Caltrain sees the blended system as free money. But there are other technologies that can and should be considered. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Do we have uh, John Montrum, Robert Schweier, or Margaret Caprill? If not, we'll go to William Sandy, Doug Roberts, and Marlene Dot. Good evening. Thank, thank you for your, your interest in high-speed rail. I'm an advocate of it. And I'm you William, are? My name is William Sandy from Los Altos. Thanks so much, Mr. Sandy. And uh, I'm an advocate of high-speed rail. I spent a lot of time in France, and I've seen it work. It's a magnificent system. And, uh, and it, it was started in the, in the 70s as a gas turbine system 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, in 1981, well, there was a, a gas embargo or fuel embargo in the 70s. And they redesigned it then for the electrical system, the electrified system. And in 1981, they opened the route between Paris and uh, Lyon. Now there are eight, eight uh, KGV lines and also the Eurostar and Thales, which goes around Benelux countries and all of that. And it, it's a wonderful system. And it's the pride of, of France. It's extended now into Spain, into Germany. You know, it, it's absolutely magnificent. And uh, I'd like to encourage uh, people to build it. It is, a, 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 I, I greatly appreciate it. And uh, also, the, with regard to the system of, of uh, the Central Valley, just building that. It, it seems to me that that's a good idea to build it. And you talked about uh, mitigating risk. That is, if, if you don't get the whole funding, you have something that you can point to as an accomplishment. But that's not success scheduling. You know, most people prefer to, 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 to schedule a program based on success, that they're going to get what it takes to do the job. And that's what they concentrate on not fallback positions, you know, if you don't get it, you don't find the funding. Well, thank you again for your, your, your meeting tonight. I thought it was very informative. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Doug Roberts to be followed by Marlene Doss, Kevin Standley, John Adams, and David Schonbaum. And thanks again for hanging in, folks. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Kevin Stanley, a former member of the Caltrain Citizens Advisory Committee and soon to be a resident of San Jose again. I'm not actually sure if we are district, but possibly. Uh, the only real problem I see with high-speed rail is that we didn't build it in the 1970s when we had the chance. I have ridden real high-speed rail in countries that have it, like Japan and in France, a country about the population and density of California, I might add. And I've seen that it works, and I think it is the proper method for joining the halves of our state. Now, I've lived my entire 46-year life here in California. And my grandfather, who raised me, was one of the people who literally built much of the infrastructure of this state as a member of the operating engineers working on Interstate 5, dams, and such like. There were people then who said we couldn't afford it, but we built it anyway. Now... I hope there are nobody here who seriously believes we shouldn't have built Interstate 5 just because there aren't very many people living between Sacramento and Los Angeles. The demographic bulge that followed my grandparents' generation seems to have been content to live off the annuities. And now they seem unwilling to invest in a crucial piece of infrastructure because they don't expect to see to live it or live to see it 
or to write it themselves. I urge you to not lose your nerve. We didn't know where the funds for the highway and water systems were going to come from when we started building them, but we did it anyway. Keep this project moving forward, and please don't let your legacy be that you presided over a going out of business sale for the baby boom. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next witness, please. Hi, I'm David Stonebun with Transvet. We're a transit advocate uh, and have been litigating high-speed rail EIRs for the last five years. We've been highly critical of the authority's route decisions, their engineering, and their ridership model. We see the authority slowly changing direction and heading in a more viable direction. We give great credit to the peer review group for that change. Um, we're more outspoken than them, however, and we vigorously oppose funding the Central Valley Project. Um, many environmental groups under the aegis of the Planning and Conservation League sent a letter to the governor saying, we don't support the Central Valley Project. And given the governor's statement that this is being done for uh, premier benefit, that creates a serious problem in credibility. Um, we think the business plan has it all backwards. The absence of private investment in the project indicates that the current project is a failure. Clearly, private operators have concluded that the politically drawn route is a money loser. We think that commercial entities that are able to design routes with higher ridership will undertake the ridership risk and build out a complete system. That is the way forward. We have requested meetings with the authority's chair um, to talk about how to make the project work. We've been waiting months and still no commitment to meet. Would like to hear a yes. Based on what I heard tonight from Mr. Hartnett, it looks like the authority is about to make a big mistake, or rather another big mistake, thinking it can defer study of a blended system until the project EIR. Unlike past EIRs, we urge the authority to respond to this one in good faith to our DEIR comments. And let me ask you to give one more sentence to wrap up, please. I don't believe SEQA creates the obstacles that were hinted at by the authority board members and say, who would sue to enforce SEQA? If it's for an environmentally superior project, we'll be cheering and not sue. Thank you very much. Next witness. John Adams, uh, San Jose. Uh, <clears throat> I noticed that uh, this is probably the a unique uh, a unique system in that uh, only one eighth of the entire cost has any funding. I mean, we talked about BART, but it had funding. Golden Gate Bridge, it had funding. We didn't start with one eighth. Uh, Proposition one A assume that some uh, you know, <clears throat> some of the funds would come from uh, federal, state, local, and uh, private. Now tonight, we never heard the word local. Uh, <clears throat> Proposition 1A assumed that perhaps the local would, would come up with 10%. That was back when it was 43 billion. Now it's 100 billion. But there is no local. San Jose, a major hub, uh, we're supporting BART, but we don't have any money for uh, uh, <clears throat> to contribute to uh, the local, and I don't know of any other that is, uh, <clears throat> any other local that's going to put, work toward that uh, 10 billion, that 10 percent, uh, and the same with private, so it's back to state and federal. Thank you for your comments. I think we've lost Doug Roberts and Marlene Dock, yes? And so our next speakers are Catherine Hung, Mark Zercher, and Edward Schlosser, to be followed by Ms. Valtraud, and, excuse me, Juan Perez. Who's up next? 
Good evening. My name is Mark Zerker. I believe I'm uh, Senator DeSalnier's only constituent here. I'm from Orinda, California, in the East Bay. High speed rail has a lot of big numbers, and it's a little hard to get your hands around it. So I decided to put it in a perspective that perhaps is a little easier to understand. In 2008, I was convinced to build a $340,000 rental home that would be completed in 2024. I had a $100,000 loan approved to help pay for it, despite my shaky credit and nearly empty bank account. Since then, the unbuilt home's price has risen to nearly a million, will not be done until 2034, even though I have 600 contractors planning its construction with questionable oversight. I still have the $100,000 loan approval, although Fannie Mae has promised another $35,000, provided I agree to build a driveway immediately. I have no idea where the remaining $865,000 is coming from, since I do not have a stable income to attract other investors. But for some reason, I'm more concerned about losing the Fannie Mae funding. The truth is, if I knew in 2008 what I know now, I never would have agreed to build this house that I simply cannot afford. However, the state legislature has the ability to unwind this deal by rejecting the Fannie Mae funds. Please, let's get real. Don't leave me as a stranded citizen and further lead our state down the path of Greece. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Edward Schlosser. Thank you. Welcome. From uh, Mountain View, thank you uh, to all of you who are here. Uh, I'm glad to hear that the High Speed Rail Authority is now committing firmly to a blended approach in the peninsula instead of a four-track disaster as previously. I hope the authority will reduce risk by providing earlier funding and more funding for work in the peninsula and in the southern bookend. I urge the legislature and the authority to ensure that all 17 cities along Caltrain be given a strong voice in planning the details. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Valkraud Herting, forgive my pronunciation. Welcome. And we need, to, we need a little help pulling that down for you. And here comes the staff. Thank you. All righty. Um, you, Mr. Samidian, my husband and I have been following you in the newspaper all the time. And every time we read something where you responded to things that happened, we were very happy. And uh, I just want to say, in the United States, we have a democracy. Where I come from, at first we did not, we had a dictatorship. And you know, all the people that are talking are the voters, are the citizens that elect the politicians. You represent us. You don't represent anybody else except the people. And that has to be remembered because people can talk through their head and everybody listens and you give them a voice. But it's just like having a dictatorship if you don't listen to the people. They vote for you. Now the project has to be submitted to the voters again because the first voting was done entirely differently on a different premises. The whole time when I was sitting up there, everybody talking, but nobody mentioned the citizens that they are protesting and we should consider the fact that we represent them. Nobody, nobody said that. It just was a lot of talk, which was to a regular person like me, not very, um, few times somebody said something that was reasonable. Now the thing is, this is here a letter to the editor which was so good on March 2nd of the year 12. Politi politicians pro promoting high-speed rail. Politicians promoting the November 2008 high-speed rail ballot preposition promised that it would cost only, I guess it was 43 billion, contributing, uh, excuse me, 
Ms. Hurdy, I'm sorry, but you're out of time. Can you give us one more sentence maybe well, to wrap up? Well, uh, the thing is there was a study made at Stanford. Uh, it was on October 12, 2010. It was in the Daily Post where the Stanford Business School on October 11, uh, 2010, issued a 100-page study on the proposed California high-speed rail system warning that it has little chance of ever paying for itself and that funding for this 43 billion project, and now it is 100, and then it's even labeled to 117 billion. Now and Ms. Hurdy, I'm, I'm gonna say thank you. We've, we've gone well over your time. Thank you for being here. I know you stayed right. a long time. Okay. Can, I, can, can, can I ask for Catherine Hung, Carla Campbell, Don Ball, Pat Peterson, and Bob Sitter? You absolutely may, and if you hand it to the sergeant right there, the, that's all right. Catherine Hung, Carla Campbell, Don Ball, Pat Peterson, Bob Simmons, Gary Jansen, Pam Farley. Folks, if you step right up, if your name was just called, please. If your name was called, step right up. Thank you. Is that coming up? I think we're going to ask my staff to hop up and help you with that real quick. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator. My name is Pat Peterson. I'm from San Jose and a constituent. The ridership estimates. <clears throat> California High Speed Rail Authority estimates 40 to 100 million riders per year. We've hold it's, heard it's um, some crazy numbers. And indeed, if you consider the Boston to DC uh, Accela route only has 15 million riders a year, um, and that's the far denser um, population density uh, than here. And Japan and France also have far higher um, densities of population, and their riderships are way down compared to what uh, they've um, um, estimated. The HSR alternative estimates are cooked books. According to longtime transportation analyst Robert Poole of the Reason Foundation, who has gone through the estimates of the authority on the alternative spending needed for air and auto and bus to accommodate future growth and calls it malpractice and urges taxpayers to sue. Huge taxpayer dollars, over 600 million, already spent, is down the rat hole. It is a sunk cost. Do not continue with this. And the last thing I would like to say is about the economic concept called opportunity cost. $98 billion is a minimum estimate. 117 was estimated in there. But it could go much higher. This is a very long-term project. Opportunity costs means what you give up for what you're spending the money on. Think of all the projects that Apple, Google, Facebook, PayPal, LinkedIn, all the other private companies or individuals could save or spend or invest in that are now being committed with these tax dollars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Peterson.